here with my partner Mark Anthony and he is the psychic lawyer and by the way we have a very special show I was uh, Mark thrilled uh, to meet Richard our guest today and um, not only just meet him but to just have him share his vision his messages along with us here at Transformation Talk Radio and in the way of a show and the popularity and of course, having a conversation with him. Now, when we started to look at this, I don't know that anyone except Richard probably had an inkling that we would do, be doing this show today and talking very deeply and very factually yeah. about something that has literally been kept under wraps for like a really long time yes so the genie is out of the bottle if i may yeah 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 <laughs> right um and, and so richard for you i mean this is more than a body of work i mean mark and i talk about each of us having a calling and yeah. when you go on a path and you are kindred spirit and you are looking at how you wake up in the morning, right? And what's on your mind, I'm not sure what you can do to not have it on your mind. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and at it, night. And at night. And at night. I was it, just going to say. Yeah. yeah. If, if you think about it, the three of us have some of the most bizarre avocations in the world. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> Richard researches and, and uh, communicates with extraterrestrial intelligence. I talk to dead people and Dr. Pat puts up with us. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I try to figure out why you guys do it. <laughs> but, you know, um, I, if I could, uh, Dr. Pat, I'd like yeah. to um, do a brief introduction uh, for Richard so that our audience knows who he is. Perfect. Uh, Richard Lawrence has been the executive secretary secretary of the Aetherius Society for over 40 years, and that was founded by Richard's friend and mentor, Dr. George King. The Aetherius Society is an international spiritual organization which is dedicated to spreading and acting upon the teachings of advanced extraterrestrial intelligences. Now, Richard has campaigned in the UK and the US for governments around the world to reveal the truth about UFOs. He's the international best-selling author of several books, including UFOs and the Extraterrestrial Message. He co-authored the last book that Dr. King uh, wrote, which was with him, and the title of that book was Contacts with the Gods from Space. Richard has appeared literally on hundreds 
of radio and TV programs around the world. He's probably been interviewed at least a thousand times. He has co-hosted a weekly show in the UK called The Phenomena Files, and he is the resident UFO expert on talk radio, which is the United Kingdom's fastest growing speech station. So everybody, we are privileged and honored to have on our show and welcome Richard Lawrence. Well, I'm very privileged and honored to be here on, on the show with both of you. And thank you very much for asking me. I, and uh, I, didn't, I don't know who prepared all that, but uh, it was very <laughs> nice of you to read that out, Mark Anthony. Do I call you Mark or Mark Anthony? Is it the um, you can name? just call me Mark. Uh, that's fine. Mark. I, okay. I, it sounds better when people with an English accent say Mark yeah, Anthony. Yeah, no kidding. I know. It takes I, us I, back a few centuries, doesn't that? It, it that's, does. Uh, and every time you yeah. said, I expect Elizabeth Taylor to materialize on <laughs> exactly, my lap. Of course. But you can keep saying it. If not Richard Burton, <laughs> one of the two. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, it's, and Pat, is it Dr. Pat or Pat? Well, yeah, Dr. Pat, most people call me. You can sure. call me Pat. Good. You know, uh, yeah. Benny calls me Pistol Pack and Patty, Patty but I don't own a gun. <laughs> and okay. so, and, you know, look. But yeah, absolutely. But getting on, I mean, you're right, yeah. though, about having you were saying earlier about having a vocation, it's 24 hours a day. Yeah. Um, UFOs, I mean, I came in on it in the sort of, when I started with the Ethereum Society. So I've been campaigning on it for four decades. And yeah. I remember the time when if you if you said governments are lying about UFOs, you were regarded as a total as they say over here, a nutter, it's not a very great phrase, but yeah. you know, you, you were absolutely lambasted uh, for even believing the governments would lie about it. And of course, now it's absolutely, as you said, the genie's out of the bottle, um, the cat is out of the bag. We now know, they know, UFOs are real. The stigma has finally gone. People out there, there's gonna be people listening to this show right now who've had UFO experiences or had UFO sightings. I had a UFO sighting last night. Um, you know, it's, it, there are thousands and thousands of these, millions actually have taken yeah. place and it's not new. It goes yeah. back to the earliest records on earth. Yes. Richard, um, I got a question. Now we all know, um, at least uh, us here on the show, but for the benefit of the listeners, on June 25th of 2021, this year, the U.S. Yeah. Director of National Intelligence released the, a report indicating that the Pentagon, the United States military, knows that UFOs are real. But here's, yeah. here's the tricky part. Unidentified flying objects are real, but we don't know what they are or if they're extraterrestrial. All right, come yeah. on. It sounds yeah. like they, they want it both ways. What's your take oh, on yeah. that? It was a step. I mean, it wasn't, I don't okay. think they were totally honest at all. <laughs> Um, but the U.S. I government think, not being honest, no uh, way. And not just, and and, be, and it's not just the U.S. I have to tell you, we had a right. debate over right. here in the House of Lords, which we still have here in the House of Parliament, and it was on the. It was actually after. I think it was June the thirtieth, and they were even worse, I would say, than the American government. They 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 said they're taking it very seriously, so that's something. There wasn't the usual chortling and after dinner drinks and laughs and etc. That's gone. Uh, but they have stopped way short of admitting what they know. And they don't even have a UFO department, they claim at least, whereas America do. And, they, and it's pretty active. And now military and naval personnel are required to report UFO sightings. So, you know, it, it's certainly not the answer. They, you're right. They're sitting on the fence and they're still saying we have no evidence that aliens exist. Obviously, they exist. They are, of course, there's a faction who's trying to use it as a, an excuse to get more weapons because they're saying it could be a threat to our defenses, whereas obviously they're friendly. But I have to just say that the Ethereum Society, way before my time, um, in 1958, put out, a, and this was Dr. George King, right. all the facts that they've come up with now. I mean, you, you mentioned the book Contacts with the Gods from Space. And in that book, which was published in 1996, uh, Dr. King revealed some of the things that came out on June the 25th of this year, such as their ability to control atmospheric friction, their ability to uh, control um, gravity, the, the, the power to uh, what they call in the report signature management uh, and invisibility and many other things. Uh, have been said, 
you know, prior. I'm not saying all those things were certified in this report, but this is now out. It's the gene is, as you say, out the bottle, and these things are known. And Dr. King was talking about this in the 1950s and writing it as well. You know, um, you, you brought up a, well, several important points. Um, AATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. I know that yes. this is something the United States has introduced. And what you mm -hmm. just said is using UFOs and the fear of it to advance military technology. So you said that they're friendly. Why do you believe that extraterrestrials are friendly? Um, what is your basis for that? Because I know a lot of people, yeah. um, because and on, you know, before we came on, Dr. Pat, and Richard and I, for the benefit of the listeners, <laughs> we're talking about the alien abductees uh, that, that we've spoken to. I've spoken to both Nancy Tremaine and Calvin Parker. And Nancy Tremaine has a more positive take than Calvin Parker on what it was like to be abducted. And he did not feel that it was a benevolent experience. So Richard, I'm asking, why do you think that these extraterrestrials are friendly? Well, it was answered um, uh, in an actual communication that Dr. King received. I mean, uh, as you may know, we, we do a program um, called the Spiritual Freedom Show on Transformation Talk Radio. Yep. And it's based on a particular communicator by the name of Mars Sector 6, uh, who uh, has communicated with Dr. King uh, since 1956. I think I'm right in saying it was 56. And in 1958, it was published, the answer to that question, and a message, a communication from that intelligence. I know this is sounding far out, and I'm, I'm happy to explain it all, but he said this, it is obvious that we are friendly. Had we not been, you would not exist. Exactly. And I, and I think it's very simple. <laughs> it's very kind of obvious. And it's amazing they dance around saying, this, is this China, is this Russia? Obviously, it isn't, and for, for a whole variety of reasons. And obviously, they're friendly because it would be so easy for them to take over this world. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have to mess yeah. about or anything. Um, it, it's just, and then there are, there are many other cases even prior to this report. I mean, I've brought CIA papers over, and I've brought papers over from the Soviet Union. Uh, of, of landings of, of a UFO and of American jet chasing a UFO. And in those reports, it's clear they're friendly. If they weren't, that jet that chased the, the, the UFO, the American jet, would have been yeah. annihilated. But it wasn't, and it could easily have been. I love how articulate you are, and I wish now I have your answer, because now when I get asked that question, and we've done it, Mark and I have done a number of shows on this, because oh, I grew yeah. up with this. I mean, right. for some strange reason, I was so attached to the black and white movies of this. But now I have a simpler answer for me. When I get asked that question, I say, oh, just watch A Quiet Place 1, and then go watch A Quiet Place 2. If you haven't seen that movie, that will tell you the answer to your question about mm. whether or not you think aliens are friendly. Because if you watch yes. that movie, you're going to get a very clear message. I want to ask you this question. I, there's something that baffles me in the report. Well, there's a All couple right. things. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand it. And you know, I, I, I consider myself a fairly decent like research reader person. Here's what I sure don't understand. Maybe she's could... being modest. She's really I, I good. gathered absolutely. <laughs> but, I, I but help see. me fill in this gap because I, you know, I asked the question. Here's the report and here's the executive summary. So here's what it says. As a result, the UAPTF concentrated its review on reports that occurred between 2004 and 2021. Like exactly. Wh good what? point. So yeah. <laughs> can we put this in perspective for a moment? And, and Richard, yes. help me. I don't like to speculate, but let's, what's the word? Let's do some proration. Mm -hmm. So in this fantastic report, 80 out of 144. Yes. 80 had yeah. observations and multiple senses. So if we did a little mm -hmm. math and we said, okay, 2004, 2144. Okay, so let's take an average of that. Let's just ballpark it. So let's say every 20 years, 144, let's extrapolate that back. Maybe let's go 100 years. How many are we really talking about? Well, yeah, it's good. 
good point. But I mean, the thing is, they took this 144 cases. And let's bear in mind another thing. This is the unclassified report. Right. There's a classified report as well. And the head of NASA, who's read the classified report, <laughs> says that he believes in, in inhabited intelligent mm. life on other planets, having read the, the classified report. Um, there are some fantastic cases. I, I brought one out myself, a CIA paper, uh, in it must have been 1980 or that, it, 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 a long time ago, yeah. uh, which is sensational. Uh, it's nothing short of sensational. The whole thing is in reproduced in my book, but you can find it on the internet. It's now quite a, a, an accessible report. They chose, I think, first of all, we've got to realize there's a lot of politics and there seems to be um, some kind of internal battle going on over this issue within the Pentagon from all yeah. that we can gather. For a start, they were definitely trying the old game of releasing it prior to the report so that when the report came out, it would seem like an anticlimax. So we've had months, haven't we? Uh, we've had a President Obama, suddenly President Clinton pipes up. After all these years and all he must have seen, suddenly he's coming out and telling us now that he, yes, oh yes, I believe in UFOs. President Obama, likewise, President Trump, pretty well, likewise. Um, and, you, know, you get the same in this country as well, we, we have it here. And other people, even from Israel and so on. And so big mm -hmm. things have come out. Now, the first big thing that came out came in 2004, and it might be by accident, or it might be through lack of coordination, as from their point of view, that the Pentagon admitted it was true. It got released out onto the internet. The Navy personnel have come out. They verified these cases, which are not just individual reports, they're backed up with infrared, they're backed up with um, satellite imagery, they're backed up with radar tracking. And they trying, I think, damage control limitation or whatever you might call it in this report. And they've, yeah. that's, I suppose, I'm guessing, why they started in 2004. But I completely agree with you. It's silly. I mean, you can go way, you can go back um, to, the, to 1950 at least. <laughs> I just thought it was odd. I mean, and, you know, I didn't pick it up the first time around that I read the report. And I just blew by me. And then when I went back, I just thought, okay, but let's get at the meat of some of this too. Because even if we're looking at what they call, by the way, a preliminary assessment, correct? Mm -hmm. right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's why it's a P-A-U-A-P, -A -A preliminary assessment. Yes. Mm -hmm. There are some showstoppers in here. Um, um, most folks that have looked at the report, the comments that come out, and let's call it our pop culture magazines, are almost underwhelming, underwhelming. But when someone like you looks at this report and then looks at your life's work, is this validating at some level or is there a giant gap between what you know and what came out? Well, <laughs> or both it maybe. <laughs> well, there's both, but I think I think the Ethereum Society, you know, which yes. you know, I'm secretary of, and it's yes. a worldwide. It's not just in it's, it's in America. It's all over the world, mm -hmm. and it's the oldest international UFO organization. I think is validated because we were saying then, as I say, back in the fifties, not me, but the society was that UFOs, as they used to say, flying saucers then are real. Uh, and also we have battled the stigma. I mean, I've gone on numerous phone-in shows yeah. just to try and help people listening to feel able to talk about their own experiences without ridicule, without embarrassment, even from their own family sometimes yes. in the past. You know, I've been to lectures where someone has stood up and given us, told us about their experience and their wife or their husband didn't know because they just felt they couldn't talk about it. So in that way, too, there's a certain validation. But does it go far enough? Not nearly far enough. And of course, it's wrapped up quite cleverly in places in sort of bureaucratic language. So they'll use a phrase like uh, they demonstrate signature management. And everyone's supposed to know what that means. I mean, I do know what that means, but it, does, it doesn't sound nearly as spectacular as saying they, have, they are capable of disappearing and going into invisibility and then rematerializing again or you know, controlling heat and, and, and some of the really tangible abilities that these incredible craft have. Hypervelocity, um, you know, outstanding performance without any propulsion units whatsoever. 
you know, Richard, that's an interesting point because I've watched a number of the videos where you hear the U.S. Navy pilots and they're describing what they're observing. And, you know, so if theoretically, the United States has the most sophisticated air force in the world and our jets can't do this. And yes. they're also saying it doesn't appear to have a tailpipe. All right. There's there's not an exhaust yeah. system. And True. from and a couple of weeks ago, we had Colonel John Alexander on who was head of the UFO U.S. military's UFO project back oh, in yes. the 70s. And he said that um, UFOs are real. And he said, and trying to understand them, it's as complicated as cancer. It's not just an easy answer. There's a lot more going on with this. Um, what is your take on that? And then I, 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 I have to ask about the, the spiritual, the communication. I got a lot of questions. I know Dr. Yeah. Pat No, does but too. it's interesting because you, those two are totally linked because I, I would say that what's going on here is that you cannot study, and some would disagree with me on this, but you can't really understand this topic without looking at the spiritual dimension to it. Oh, I, I go can, that far. I uh, and completely agree. I'm sorry. That, again, is very important to the Ethereum Society. It was very important to Dr. King, and he used to get criticized and uh, ostracized in the old flying saucer movement for saying yeah. it. Uh, because there used to be a, like a nuts and bolts fraternity as against the spiritual fraternity. And even MUFON at one time, uh, not the last time I went and spoke at MUFON events, actually, when my, when my book came out, not at all. But in the, in the past, they didn't like the spiritual approach very much either. And you have societies here who are the same. But, you know, really, when you think that the first really big and really important UFO, so-called, or flying saucer, whatever you want to call it, was the Pup Shark of Vimana, the Vimana being a flying celestial vehicle, the Ramayana, which is the oldest, probably the oldest text upon earth, or certainly one of them. And you've got it right through the Bible. And then you've got it in the, in the Buddhist, you've got the concept of lokas or inhabited realms throughout space. Uh, then you've got concepts in science now, which are moving to the spiritual, whether they like it or not. I mean, you know, dark energy of itself, yes. saying that only 4% of the matter in the universe is visible, opening up the, the possibility of multidimensional existence uh, so that you could have life on Mars, which we can't physically see or detect, which is something Dr. King was again saying in the 1950s. Um, you know, this is, this is taking us in a spiritual dimension. That doesn't do away with science at all. The two other, actually, they're two sides of the, it's a cliche, but they're two sides of the same coin. Well, it, it appears to be a very much akin to string theory in that yeah. there are multi-dimensions. Interesting, my, my, my new book coming out, The Afterlife Frequency, I talk about oh. multi-dimensions, okay? Right. Oh, and, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah and and um, what Dr. Alexander, uh, Colonel John Alexander was saying, is that it's they're not tin cans flying through space for thousands of years, but they actually have created a warp field where they're able to jump from one dimension or one coordinate of course. So, you know, simultaneously. So they're not violating Einstein's theory of relativity. They're actually working in conjunction with it, that space and time curve, and they figured of an energy source powerful enough to cause it to jump from one coordinate to the next. And that makes yeah. so much sense. And yeah. I connect that, and this is getting to what you're talking about with the spiritual realm, is that what I'm doing as a medium is I'm communicating, what I call what I do, um, I just saw a reading for, sh uh, for shorthand, it's interdimensional communication. I'm communicating yeah. with another dimension, and it yes. appears that these beings are also interdimensional travelers. Indeed, they are. And may I just say that Dr. King himself yeah. was able to, to channel or act as a medium for intelligences from other planets, which I don't do. But what I do do is communicate uh, with intelligences from other realms of this Earth. So I, I'm on the same page on you as you there, Mark, and I've had a contacts for decades actually the first book i wrote was called unlock your psychic powers and so that's an, a great interest of mine as well oh my god but i'm I, so I, i'm so excited <laughs> <laughs> so we're on the same page there and and 
it's an amazing thing. I mean, I the kind of mediumship that I do, I don't know about yourself. I don't do trance mediumship. I I, I actually do clairaudient, you might say, yeah. mediumship. Dr. King himself entered full trance, but he used samadhi, uh, the old yoga. Yeah. He, his training yeah. was in yoga, yoga, and that's very yeah. unusual for an Englishman in the sort of 1940s and early 50s. It's very unique. And he was doing it eight hours a day um, for 10 years wow. after the Second World War. And he sort of mastered some of the forms of yoga and he entered samadhi. And so the type of mediumship he actually did is way above what I would do uh, or would be capable of doing. And as a result, he had these amazing, um, incredible transmissions and you can actually hear them as well. And, and we sometimes we play extracts on the Spiritual Freedom Show. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna take a short break and when we come back, I really wanna talk about this tapestry. And, you know, the tapestry, which includes, you know, Dr. King's first conversation, the command, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, how this web that gets weaved generation after generation and how it shows up in the world. And, you know, one of the most important things, too, you know, in speaking with you about this, Richard, is also for us to really get to the why factor. You know, many people yeah. want to just not do it. They don't want to go down the why path, right? It's it's like, why is either they're here to kill us or they're not. I mean, it, th that's usually the black and white of it. And it's really not mm. that. No. But how much more kind of physical evidence beyond this report, like structures that human beings could not build, even today could not build them, but how much more might we need to get a sense that we are not all there is? I want to go to break. And, you know, here's what my mama used to say when us three girls would watch one of those flying those movies. And my mama, right, she, we used to say to her things like my stepsisters, that doesn't happen. That's not real. And my mama, who is from the South, first child at 12, second at 13, would look at my sister Joyce and say, well, honey, now, how do you think that little bugs are created on the earth? Now, how do you think this, how do you think this big ocean's created? Now, what makes you think that we are so arrogant not to believe that creation is limited to a fly you can swat and a humanity that lives maybe 60 years. And we were 11. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back to talk about the conundrum we live in. Is it real? Do we know it innately? And what does Richard know that he's going to share? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Psychic in the Dock. I'm Mark Anthony, the Psychic Lawyer, Psychic Explorer, and I'm here with my incredible co-host, the one, the only, street smart spiritualist and behavioral psychologist, Dr. Pat Basili. And we're, we have a special episode of The Day the Earth Stood Still today with our guest, uh, Richard Lawrence of the Aetherius Society. And he is a world-renowned expert in UFOs. Richard, how can our listeners find out more about you? Well, do visit my website, which is richardlawrence.co.uk. I've got lots of stuff up there right now about UFOs, but we're also holding an event, and that's at ethereus.org, the Ethereus Society's website, and we're putting on an event on the 29th of July. UFOs are real, friendly, and alien. Governments know it. And we're going to be actually, we're so validated as an organization, as we were discussing earlier, by this some of the things that have come out, not only from the Pentagon, actually. And we're going to be going beyond and giving the answers that they don't give. Uh, so we're going to say things that governments won't say. And what, what's it all about? Why are they here? Why don't they land openly? When will they land? Have they landed? What's their message? And what's the spiritual dimension? So that's on the 29th of July. It's a live stream event. Uh, I'll be doing it myself. So it comes out at... 1 p.m. Pacific time and 4 p.m. Eastern time. Anyway, all the details are at ethereus.org. So, Richard, um, I have to ask, when 
you and Dr. King are communicating with the aliens. Obviously, you're using a form of mediumship. And right. mediumship is based on uh, based on my research, ele receiving electromagnetic impulses because everything, right. you know, in the EM spectrum moves at the speed of light. All right. So you're communicating with them. Um, tell us about that. How does that work? Explain okay, the for the, yeah, the, the novice, what are you guys doing? Okay. Well, the first thing is that I don't do it. Dr. George King did it. Um, I do, as I mentioned to you, sort of what I would call basic channeling, Mm -hmm. uh, with inter people from this world, very interesting people, actually, and some of them <laughs> incredible uh, people, but they're not interplanetary, they're not as advanced as that. Now, Dr. King, he used somatic trance, which is a very advanced um, yogic condition, um, and without going into all the technicalities, in it involves the Kundalini, if people have heard of that, being raised to a very high psychic center at will, um, by Dr. King. He could do that. And then he was able to concentrate his mind completely on the beam that was radiated to a particular psychic center. And then he would, he would enter trance and the communicating intelligence would speak through him. And he did this for a period of, well, he started in 1954. And the last time he did it in that state, I believe was 1981. And after that, he just went purely with the mental transmissions, you might say. Uh, which, he, which he wrote down or recorded in his own voice. But up to there, you have a complete consistency in the communicator. So you could hear a particular communicator, for example, the master Ethereus has very distinctive tonality. So you're not just getting words, you're getting energy. You mm -hmm. mentioned energy, you're right. getting the energy right. of the communicator and they are very, very different. The style is different. The voice is different. Now, as you mentioned, as well as being my mentor, my teacher, uh, Dr. King was also a very, very close and very dear friend of mine. So I, I know because he had a tremendous sense of humor and he, we would do you know, a lot of jokes and sometimes it would involve putting on voices and accents and so on. And he, he was okay at that, but he wasn't fantastic at it at all. Uh, I would say it was, it was it was he was very entertaining, extremely amusing, but he wasn't exactly an, a you know professional mimic or something like that. And yet, when he was in trance, you would hear a voice recorded in 1956, and you'd hear it again in 1979, and it would be exactly the same. Um, it, the, the consistency. In fact, I I was one of the co-authors with a, a friend of mine who who was secretary in America called Brian Kanik, and we wrote his biography. Uh, two years ago and the validity the sort of the consistency of the communications that he received are incredible and the more you sort of hone down on them the more credible they become not the less credible they become and we had to do that because we were trying to get to the bottom because one of our problems he was so modest that he didn't reveal everything about himself. And we wanted to find out more. And we found out quite a lot uh, by sort of studying it very, very closely. But that's getting off your question. The main point being that he had sort of, he had mastered this state of samadhi, which is normally used uh, by, for example, Yogananda would be a person who could enter samadhi. Right. Swami Vivekananda would be another one. Swami Sivananda would be another one but in more recent times, but they would use it for, you know, mainly anyway, deep meditation, deep realization. He used it for trance mediumship, which is, I think, maybe unique, but it's certainly unusual. So was he communicating with one particular um, entity or collective or, and, and because the follow-up question is, is there any indication where, they're coming from a particular star system constellation, yeah. a different galaxy. What? You know, I've got, I have to say that it always, um, and, and I'm not decrying anybody when I say this, but I always find it a bit strange that some people will be getting their communications or believing they're getting their communications from some very distant constellation. Yeah. Uh, when in fact, the planets who, with whom we are the, by far the most connected are the planets in this solar system. 
Right. And uh, Dr. King, it wasn't exclusively from this solar system, but it was nearly exclusively from this solar system. It was from Mars, it was from Venus, it was from Jupiter, it was from Saturn. And of course, when he was doing it, uh, people were saying, well, there's no life there. There can't be life there. Some people still say that now, but not everyone. I mean, we over here, we have an astronomer royal. Of course, we would in this country, but what he is is a sort of top astronomer. And I've done an interview with him on the radio, and he has said he thinks there could be life on Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, there's this massive change. And when you throw in what you were talking about, Mark, the multidimensional aspect, that there can be life on another frequency or energy level on those planets, well, that's what Dr. King was saying way back then in the 1950s. This, this may sound like a stretch, but um, we tend to classify things on the basis of what we know and what we understand. And this became very apparent um, when paleontologists and archaeologists were studying dinosaurs. You know, the in initial thought was they're gigantic lizards. Now the thought is, well, they're actually some avian, you know, they're, they're like birds. But it's entirely possible that maybe they're like birds, maybe they're like mammals, maybe they were like reptiles, maybe they were something completely different than what exists now. And so... Mm -hmm. We're thinking that um, aliens, yeah, maybe they're going to look like the greys or, you know, the, the, the various depictions that we see in E.T. And, and all these other things. Or maybe they're completely alien to what we understand as a life form. Does that make any sense? It does. And Dr. King did speak of completely alien life forms and, and the tiny, minute life forms and and metallic life forms and insect looking like life forms that might actually be far more intelligent than the human race, which wouldn't be very difficult at all. No, <laughs> and he'd, he'd say that. Uh, but the ones that he came into contact with or was aware of were generally in humanoid form. That might be because they chose to be in humanoid form. And of course, we have a history and I have to stress this. I mean, it's not, I've mentioned a few religions, also the ancient Greeks, also the Egyptians, of this contact with deities, with intelligences, with gods, if you like to call them that, with heroes of old, whatever they're called, from other worlds. And so they have visited us through the ages in humanoid form. And you also have the concept of the avatar, that Hindu concept mm -hmm. of an intelligence which, you, you know, can apply to, I mean, Jesus, we're told right. by believers in, in that religion of Christianity, is the son of God. That's a, a very old concept. Um, I think the one and only is an unfortunate addition to that. But the son of God, there, there, there are sons of God in ancient Greece, in um, the Hindu scripts, and so on. This is not new. This is an avatar. And in the Aetherist Society, it's our belief that some cosmic intelligences through the ages have chosen to be actually inc incarnated, uh, a great sacrifice on their part, but in order to live among us and actually take karma mm -hmm. and give great teachings and, and perform great acts of service, some of which mm -hmm. are silent and unknown to us. Yeah, what I love is that the question has changed. And, you know, when I look at this from a, you know, I, let's just look at it from a, from a science versus science perspective, the question has changed. The question used to be, are we alone? Now the question is, where are the aliens? And what I mean by that, it's this change True. for science. So what this report has done is it's changed, not just contextually, but when you look at the debate that went on between Condon and Storick, and you look at 1968 versus 1998 and picking up that study again, you still have this level of mistrust. But even with the mistrust, right, we're talking about 90,000 research and current grants awarded by the National Science Foundation. All right. And yet there's some reports on that that don't use the same baseline as this particular report has. So what I look at when I think about this, Richard, and, and love for you to comment on, you know, we now have some baselines that were debunked because the old study was empirical, right? Where's yeah. the data? You know, that old thing. Yeah. But yeah. now you have these multi-sensory, let's just call them evidence. Yes. But here's really the question, right? There's a motivation now in the scientific community. What they've discovered is what? 
4,500 planets orbiting other stars, and then yeah. 300 million habitable worlds just in the Milky Way. And now we're starting to look at this from a different perspective, which makes sense to the average person, you see? Yeah. I mean, yeah. think about it. What is it? I think Fermi, the Fermi paradox talked about some of this, but how do you then explain that in 2020, NASA resumed funding SETI? I mean, something's happening, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And it's happening in, in, in many disciplines, isn't it? Oh. I mean, it's, in, you know, in your field. I mean, I, I was sent the Scientific American, uh, I think in June. Um, about the spiritual aspect of psychiatry oh, um, yeah. being needed, working, um, you know, the, 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 the incredible statistics about people who, if there's a God dimension or a spiritual dimension, you know, they're far more likely to recover from depression. And people, I mean, the, I've always thought, and I think I said this on your show, actually, Dr. Pat, at one yeah. point, that, um, you know, we've, we talked about mental repression sexual repression physical yep. repression but we don't talk about soul repression right and yet that's a, a more damaging thing to the psyche than any of the others even and uh, in terms of ufos they've tried for a long time in the period you're talking about condon and all of that to keep spirituality out of it they're still trying a bit <laughs> and I, I i think there's i've told there is a, a faction in the pentagon who are sort of evangelical believers who who think it's all of the devil there was another congressman who came out and said well hang on you know these have been coming since ezekiel i noticed one of the one of the congressmen commented we've got to get into this but what whichever you look at it the spiritual aspect to ufos is the key and that's something dr king always said and his communications always said i mean the most important probably the most important ufo that we talk about in the ethereum society isn't even visible doesn't even wish to be visible it's satellite number three it's called mm. and it's radiating spiritual energy to the world for everyone who wishes to to use and you know healing you don't have to even believe in the society or, or any of our beliefs to to use that energy and it's being beamed out right now and it, it enhances all spiritual action and that's the thing that they always said and right up through all of Dr. King's communications, that's the key, solving the spiritual energy crisis, whether it's within the individual or whether it's within the human race. And you, you nailed it. I mean, if we could really open our minds to the psycho-spiritual aspect of really looking at the people that we know have been classified in the world of psychiatry and, psych and psychology that have mm. been put in a box, institutionalized, some of them not, but how about medicated? And, yeah. you know, when we look at what some of these folks have said, especially in the context of, let's call it this report, but many others, it makes you wonder if you're in my profession, well, are they right? Were they right? Hmm. And this is, a, this is part of the show we did, but now the world is opening up. You see, isn't it less of we're right, you're wrong? Isn't it now a new portal that's been open for all of us? Absolutely. It's not right. It's not wrong. It just is. Yes. And I, and I mentioned these polls, you know, and um, they, they are quite staggering, really. I'm just trying to sort of pull one up here. In yeah, front of please. Me. So we've got one here that's came out from the Pew Research Group last month. And uh, just to give a couple of figures here, 65% of Americans uh, believe that intelligent life exists on other planets. Only 34 say it doesn't. 51% say that UFOs uh, reported by the people in the military are evidence of intelligent life. Not, not just that they believe in them, they're evidence of intelligent <laughs> life beyond Earth. And 51% uh, say that UFOs are not a threat to US national security. Many more than say that they are. But they think they're friendly. And this is interesting. 12%, that's over 30 million Americans, said they've been following the story a lot. So there's an avid interest in, in this topic uh, by people. Um, and other figures there, and it's same in British polls as well, they don't trust the government. They don't believe the government's telling us the whole truth. I mean, I, I must say, I do remember going on a TV show in the 1980s on this topic when, you know, you, you were, it was, it was almost a source of embarrassment to be yeah. doing what I was doing then. I wasn't embarrassed because I didn't care, but a lot of people did. 
And I remember an astronomer, the number one TV astronomer in Britain at the time, saying he didn't believe there was any inhabited life on any planet beyond Earth, <laughs> intelligent <laughs> life. You know, and it now sounds mad, but he, he was highly credited and greatly <clears throat> respected. His name, you, you may even know, Mark Anthony, from your time in England, Patrick Moore. Uh, but yeah. he did say that. Uh, and, you know, he, he changed later. But that was the kind of belief. And I, th I think the people who don't believe in UFOs and don't believe in alien life are in danger of being ridiculed. themselves. I won't ridicule them, but I think no. they're in danger of being ridiculed. Like they'll end up like the flat earth believers, I think. Um, abductees. Does the Ethereum yeah. Society interview or interact with people who report having been abducted by by extraterrestrials it's not something we really go into a lot more i know you've gone into this from what you've told me a lot right. i i mean obviously we're open-minded um our central belief is that ufos are friendly so i know that, and that doesn't lessen the experiences of people who who say that they're they they've had unpleasant or difficult experiences but they have to be looked at as i'm sure you know probably better than I do, but they've got to be looked at extremely carefully because there's so many psychic possibilities. And likewise in mediumship and in channeling, where people can be genuinely channeling, but the person they're channeling is an, is an imposter or is a person who's saying that they are from another planet and actually they're not, or indeed that they... The, the, the medium gets their identity wrong, which isn't the fault of the guide, if you like, uh, but nevertheless, you know, they think it's the Virgin Mary, and then it isn't the Virgin Mary. It's it's a, a very good woman, but not the Virgin Mary. And what does the, well, what does the guy do? It carries, so you you I'm, I digress a bit there. But with with abductions, it, it, it's it's uh, it, there's so much room, I think, for interference as well. Which it doesn't. I'm certainly not saying they're all fake, or I don't believe in any abductions. Um, but it also appears based on the abductees that I've spoken to, and I've also spoken to MUFON, and yeah. there's not just one species, if you will, coming to here. The, yes. There's, there's um, I've heard that there's at least five different species that have been identified, and I have a feeling that's probably on the really low side. What <laughs> is your take on that? Again, you know, I'm no expert on it at all. Uh, we, we do believe that we have some protection on this planet, that we certainly believe there are evil, hostile aliens out there. But well, we do on, believe... On, yeah, yeah, on some planet, the equivalent of the Nazis had to win. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. But not in this solar system, in, 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 which is what we focus on mainly in the Ethereum Society. Yeah. We, we believe the planets in this solar system are highly civilized, highly spiritual they have their specialities benevolent so Mar benevolent. Yeah. benevolent i mean active um practical uh, so you know some of them will be more technologically focused some will be more um, musical or color focused and some will be more teaching focused and so on depending on the planet and and their particular role there but um so th we are protected tremendously um and also, there are very hostile intelligences on this earth, I'm very sorry to say, um, I mean, psychically as well, yeah. um, who will gain great pleasure out of pretending to be all sorts of forces uh, of various kinds. So, you know, I'd have to judge every case on its own merit or not even judge at all. But mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the five different species uh, as being alien species. I haven't come mm -hmm. across that, Mark. Okay. Did, did the study, uh, do you know if the studies, I, a friend of mine gave me a message, but I couldn't find the study, so I don't like to quote it. But one of the questions that was asked is, do you believe they walk amongst, amongst us? And I yeah. find that an interesting question. He gave Very. me a number, but I could not find the survey that he asked. And th yeah. that I find is interesting because it's showing up everywhere in our pop culture. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think... They have walked among us, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I believe Jesus came, here's a controversial thing, came from another planet. And I don't believe the star of Bethlehem was a star. And I don't believe that <laughs> Moses was tra traveled up Mount Sinai in a cloud either. 
um, you know, and I, I, so I believe Moses came from another planet and Sri Krishna, uh, who traveled mm. in Vimanas, as did the great Rama mm -hmm. in the Ramayana, when it was, I mean, very openly described beautiful celestial craft, much better terms than flying saucer or Tic Tac, <laughs> you know, which is what we get now. Um, and, it, and it runs through the centuries. Um, and yes, I do believe, likewise, Dr. Pat, they've walked among us and that mm -hmm. sometimes they do walk among us, yes. Wow. Well, I hope yeah. you'll come back, Richard. I know. I'd yeah. love to. I'd you know, we to. have there's so much that we could continue to talk about, but I think this is one of these conversations. I like to call it a progressive conversation, only because there's more to be revealed, and every day there yes. is more coming. Mark. Absolutely, and uh, Richard, I, I look forward. We have just scratched the surface of the cosmic sure. iceberg. <laughs> um, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> I, I like mean, it. there there's there's so much here to talk about. And um, so for all the listeners, you've been listening to The Psychic and the Doc with our special guest, Richard Lawrence. And we've been doing a lot on UFOs and extraterrestrial life because July is UFO month because yeah. of the Roswell yeah. crash on July mm -hmm. 7th of 1947 yeah. in New Mexico, which the official U.S. statement mm -hmm. was that it was a weather balloon. Yeah. Oh, yes. I trust that one. <laughs> Don't <Yeah. you>, Richard? <laughs> Richard, That's how where do the people... government started all I know. In their, their cover ups. <laughs> how do people find out about you? How do we tune into the show? Why don't we let folks know more about that? How do they follow you as well? well Read well, your blogs. Do... Do, do come to richardlawrence.co.uk and uh, do ask any questions you have. Do please listen to our Spiritual Freedom Show. We're out every yeah. Saturday on Transformation Talk Radio. It's a great show. Uh, not every Saturday. I'm sorry. The first and third Saturdays, I should say. It's I watch. Nine. I listen to them over again. Oh, thank you. It's, it's 9 a.m. PT and yep. uh, one, what is it? Would that be 12 noon, wouldn't it? Yes. Um, yeah, ET. 12 noon. And also, of course, ethereus.org. That where you'll hear all about the Ethereum Society and you mm -hmm. can also join our event on the 29th of July at 9 p.m. over in Britain. But over here, all the times I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, do exactly. find out all about it on ethereus.org. Wow. Richard, thank you so much. Thank you Mark. so much. It's very nice to meet you, Mark. And it's Likewise. always wonderful to be with you, Dr. Pat. Thank you very much. So much more to talk about. Thank you, Mark, so much for everything today. I want to thank you all for tuning us in. Stay tuned next week. We're coming right back at you on The Psychic and the Doc. We'll see you then. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to The Psychic and the Doc with Mark Anthony and me, Dr. Pat but silly right here on transformationtalkradio.com. Hey, look, come back next week so we can explore with you more of life's many challenges and learn from fascinating guests. And you know what? Even Mark and me. We'll connect you and discover insights from people in this life and from the afterlife. Extraordinary problems? Yeah, they do. They require extraordinary solutions. But step into the world of possibilities with us on The Psychic and the Doc. That's every Thursday. 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on TransformationTalkRadio.com. That's TransformationTalkRadio.com. And don't forget, we're also live face-to-face -face on Facebook.com, Transformation Talk Radio. <laughs>